Testing, testing. I warned you. I warned you. Okay. Um, Today's passage is Daniel 6, 1 through 11. Please stand for the reading of God's word. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom, with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor ne- ne- wow. negligent. <laughs> See, warned you. <laughs> Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So the administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, may King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict. I did not have time to practice this. And enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, so confession time. I sprung that on her this morning, and she did great anyway. Um, And if you don't think so, then you're up next week, all right? (laughs) So I have no problem bringing you a paper and uh, doing it. So, Um, well, happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Um, Yes, thank you, fathers, yeah. Um, It's always interesting in church, um, the difference between Mother's Day and Father's Day, when you kind of gear messages towards that. On Mother's Day, it's always, mothers, we love you. You are so great. You're perfect. You just, uh, and Father's Day is always like, hey, knucklehead, do better, right? <laughs> that's, that's how it always feels a little bit is, uh, you know, the, the mothers, we don't want to say anything bad against the moms. And the fathers were like, come on, men, step it up. Um, so hopefully today will be more of a, an encouragement rather, rather than that. In 1999, James Patterson and Peter Kim wrote a book called The Day America Told the Truth. And in this book, they ask Americans a series of questions. And the people who answered were um, to remain anonymous if they just promised that they would answer truthfully. And so what came out of this book was truthful answers from people. And one of the questions was, what would you be willing to do for $10 million? What would you be willing to do? 25% said they would abandon their family. 16% would leave their spouses. 23% would become a prostitute for a week or more. 7% would kill a stranger. 3% would put their children up for adoption. And remember, this book took place in 1991, and I don't think it's uh, a stretch to say we've gone downhill even more since then morally. Uh, And as Christians, we are called to live lives that reflect the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And with that, I think it's beneficial to do a routine or honest check of ourselves to keep us in line uh, with the will of God so we don't slip to a place where we answer like some of the people in that poll did. And so today, as we celebrate Father's Day, I think it's important because in this nation, we have a fatherhood crisis on our hands. And here's the truth. Where a father is absent in the home, 
there are a whole lot more problems that are likely to happen. Not saying they will, but more likely statistically to happen. That's not to diminish the amazing work that mothers do, especially single mothers. Um, some of the single mothers we have met have been amazing. And I have to say that um, where the ideal is lacking, God's grace shows up all the more. Amen. Amen. But one study found that when a father goes to church, the odds of their kids not only attending church, but remaining in the faith long term increases by a lot. Not just a little bit, but a lot. Um, and what they found in the study was that the father's presence in spiritual matters has more sway on children than anyone else in, out there. They have more sway spiritually over than mothers, than grandmothers, friends, anyone else. And it shows that um, if in, in a home, the ideal is that both parents are, are attending. But if um, the mother attends and the father does not attend, the increase in their likelihood of staying in the faith is only marginal. Where if the father attends and the mother does not attend, the increase is big. And in fact, it, it was like twice the, twice the chances, actually, of just a father attending, even if the mother doesn't go. And so all that to say is... Um, that fathers are important. And in the midst of this fatherhood crisis, we need more men of integrity leading in their families and in churches. Amen. And the Bible puts great emphasis on integrity, integrity, and it's important for us. And one of my favorite characters in the Bible is Daniel, simply because he was a man of integrity. Now, the word integrity means to be complete or whole, or I like this definition, to be undivided, to be undivided. It means that what you say and what you mean are the same thing. And the story of Daniel is a story of integrity. And if you know the story of Daniel, he lived an interesting and hard life. When he was just a kid or a teen, his home country was invaded by Babylon. He was, take, he was captured and taken away from his home to a foreign land where he was to be educated and put into the king's service. I mean, think about that. Before you're even an adult, you have been invaded by a foreign military, taken captive, and now you're in their educational system being trained to be one of their officials. And yet, in everything he did, he not only excelled, but he did it with integrity. Amen. And Daniel refused to back down from what he knew what was right, regardless of circumstance around him. So this morning, we're going to dive into this topic of integrity based on Daniel's life. And what I really hope to do is, especially for the fathers in the room, this applies to all of us, but especially for the fathers in the room, to really answer that question, do I live with integrity? So what does it look like to live with integrity? Well, first, a person of integrity keeps their word. Keeps their word. Like I said, uh, at the start of Daniel's life was rough. He was taken captive from Israel in his teens, he was tested early on. And if you go to chapter 1 of Daniel, right after he's taken captive to Babylon, he is chosen to be educated to serve the king. And him and some of his fellow captives were to eat the food from the king's table. Only one problem with that was the food served from the king's table went against the Jewish dietary law to eat. So if you read through the Old Testament, those fun books like Leviticus and Deuteronomy that everyone loves so much, right? Yeah. You, you, you get the Jewish dietary law, um, and there's restrictions to it. And no doubt that what the king is serving in Babylon, of all places, goes against that dietary law. But it says in uh, chapter 1, verse 8, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in that way. Now, I think not many people, including Daniel's fellow Jews, could have blamed Daniel for just going ahead with this. Um, he was in a strange land. He did not know the consequences for not eating from the king's table. And let's face it, he probably felt the lure of temptation to try something different. Um, I know when I was little and my mom said I couldn't have something, well, guess what I wanted, right? It's always it's something about human nature to want what we can't have. <laughs> But it says that Daniel resolved not to defile himself. Another version says that he purposed in his heart. The idea is that Daniel had a predetermined decision made. He already knew what he was, would do before the situation ever presented itself. 
He remembered the commitment he had made to God to follow the laws of God. And he kept his promise. He kept that word. And the truth is, if we wait until temptation comes to decide what we're going to do with it, we will fail every time. Why? Because we have to resolve to do God's will beforehand. If we just, like, you know, wait till the situation comes, we're really good at making excuses and justifying our actions in the moment, aren't we? Well, this isn't that bad. I can kind of, right? That's the path to, to, to sin. But Daniel didn't let circumstances sway his commitments. He stayed true, and the results were favorable. He convinced the overseer to let him eat nothing but vegetables and water for 10 days. And at the end of those 10 days, he and his fellow Hebrews who followed that looked the best rather than the others who ate from the king table. And you see God already rewarding him for his integrity. Secondly, a person of integrity does what is right when they could get away with it. They do what is right when they could get away with it. If we fast forward to chapter 6, what we read this morning, Daniel has become a huge success. He is now one of three men in charge of the entire kingdom. He was in a position of power, and verse 3 says he did his job so exceptionally well that the king put him over everyone else in the entire kingdom. So it's almost like Joseph all over again. Daniel is now second in command of the entire kingdom other than the king. The character that Daniel displayed in his younger years has followed him to his later years, and God has blessed him with position and power. Well, as often happens, some of his peers didn't like that very much, and so they conspired against him and searched for something he had done wrong. But what did they find in verse 4? It says, and the administrators and his staff traps tried to find grounds to charge against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Now imagine saying that about one of our government officials today. <laughs> um, they say with great power comes responsibility, but the truth is with great power also comes temptation. With power comes temptation. And you know what? Daniel probably had temptations because of his power. He could have taken money from the treasury, abused his position for his own gain, committed a number of immoral acts. After all, who would find out? He's in power. Who would call him out on it? He's in command. But he didn't. He stayed true even when he could have gotten away with it. The question we all need to ask is, would we? We live in a society where we expect those in power to be corrupt in some way, don't we? (laughs) I mean, think about just the past few years and our politics and all the things that have come out and continue to come out. What we see is that there's people in public who live one way, but their private lives are entirely different in the way they present themselves in public. They look really good when people are watching, but when a spotlight is off of them, They're corrupt and and, and sinful. They're different people. Titus 2, 7 through 8 encourages us to show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. So that any opponent may be put to shame having nothing evil to say about us. If our words about faith and our actions don't match up, then something is amiss in our lives. I mean, imagine if basically Daniel was put on trial by these men looking for something that he had done wrong. And it's hard to imagine that a government official at that high of a place, that they could find nothing against him and he had nothing to hide Because he was the same person no matter where he was or what he was doing. And others took notice. That's why he had been promoted to such a high position, because of his integrity. But these men became jealous and frustrated because they couldn't find any fault against him. And then they finally realized how they could trap him in verse 5. We will never find any basis for charge against this man Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God. And that leads to number three is a person of integrity does right, even in hard circumstances. 
A person of integrity does what is right, even in hard circumstances. These conspirators went to the king and they played on his ego. They had the king create a law that it was illegal for anyone to pray to a god other than himself for 30 days. I mean, talk about a self-serving law, right? Um, I don't even know how that works. Like, I don't want people praying to me as a leader. That's, that's awkward. But what they found was that the most important thing in Daniel's world was God. And if they could get him to break the law in some way, it would have to be, have to do with his God. And in verse 10 it says, Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room, where he opened his window towards Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God, just as he had done before. It's almost like this law didn't even phase him. And he didn't even attempt to hide it. He just went home and did this as he always did. Now, I don't know about you, but I might have at least shut the window praying in my closet if I just found out that like it was now illegal to pray to anyone but the king. Um, but he was praying out in the open. Everyone could see. Now, as many people would say, that's crazy. But for Daniel, it was a matter of priorities. He put God's law above man's law. And he knew the danger involved. He also knew, though, what really mattered in his life. That the strength he needed, the guidance he needed, wasn't found in his position. It wasn't found in the king. It was found in God himself. He was saying that I know what matters most. And if it's going to be against the law for me to serve God, then I'm guilty. He was a man who followed so he, he was a great administrator. He was a great position. He had great wealth and power. But when it came time to choose between God and those things, he didn't even blink. He went home and he prayed just as he always had done. And I think we all need to maybe just ponder what our response would be in that situation. That Daniel didn't hide his praying, but instead he did what he knew to be right, even when the circumstances were telling him otherwise, where the circumstances were saying this is against the law and there are dire consequences. And that leads to four, a person of integrity does right despite the cost. Often there will be a cost attached to doing the right thing. And I'm sure Daniel knew it would happen in verse 13. Then they said to the king, Daniel is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or the decree you put in writing. He prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. He violated the king's law, and at that time in the Persian Empire, once a law was decreed and put into action, not even the king could revoke it. So with great sorrow, the king orders that Daniel be thrown into the lion's den. Now, most of us, we probably know the story. That Daniel is thrown into the lion's den. That an angel of the Lord comes into the lion's den and shuts the lion's mouths. And Daniel stays there till morning. And the king comes and finds Daniel alive and pulls him out. And begins to recognize Daniel's God as the one true God. But I have to think that Daniel probably thought he was going to die in that den. I don't think Daniel probably knew what was going to happen when he was put into that hole. I think very well Daniel may have thought that that was going to be it for him. And yet he was willing to go through with it because his priority was God above everything else. He was willing to die for God rather than compromise on what he knew was right. And Daniel was a man with much to lose. He had power and position and wealth and had a great life. But the most important thing, and he recognized it as the most important thing, was his relationship with God. And he was willing to throw away the luxuries and the comfort of the world for God. He had an unwavering commitment to God, the kind of commitment that stands out. And here's the truth, that God does not call us to be just partly in. He calls us to be fully committed. Amen. He calls us to be people of commitment where he is the top priority. In Romans 12, 
And Paul encourages us with this. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, 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 <laughs> to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That's a commitment level. Offer your bodies a living sacrifice to God. Now let me ask it like this. Uh, for those of us who are married, what if your spouse said, I'm 90% committed to you? <laughs> I mean, that's an A, right? <laughs> Would we accept that? Or even, I'm 99% committed to you. Uh, no. Uh, how, but, but how often do we try to give God 90 or even 99 and think that we're good? I heard a story about a man in Haiti who wanted to sell his house. And another man wanted to buy it very badly. Um, but because he was poor, he couldn't afford the full price. After much bargaining, the owner agreed to sell the house for half the original price with just one stipulation. That he would retain ownership of one nail above the door of one nail well they agreed and after several years the original owner came back and wanted to buy his old house back but the owner was unwilling to sell so the original owner went out he found the carcass of a dead dog and hung it from the one nail he still owned in the house well soon the house became unlivable and was forced to sell back to the original owner and the moral was this, if we leave the devil with even one small peg in our life, he returns to hang his rotting garbage from it, making us unfit for Christ. If you leave just part of your life uncommitted, Satan will find it. It may be just a crack in a wall, but he will start to chip away at that crack, and it'll be a bigger crack, crack and pretty soon it becomes a small hole and a bigger hole, and pretty soon the structure is unsound, because we left part of ourselves uncommitted. Daniel did not leave a nail of his house in question. He kept his word. He did what was right. He was willing to give all for his relationship with God because a man of integrity keeps his word, does what is right when no one is looking, despite the circumstances. And lastly, a person of integrity is blessed by God. The king came back, the lion's den the next morning, and saw a miracle. Daniel was alive. And he called Daniel out. In verse 22, it says, My God sent an angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I done any wrong before you, your majesty. And then in verse 28, So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. God saved Daniel from the mouths of the lions. And it says that well, at the end of the day, Daniel prospered. God gave him back everything he was willing to give up. No, I'm not saying that God's necessarily going to do it like that. He may not make us wealthy or give us positions of power or anything like that. But I do believe that God does bless people of integrity. If you look at Daniel's life, he had a lot of tough decisions. But at every crossroad, he chose to go God's way. And at every decision he made for God, he was blessed in some way. There are many verses in the Bible that talk about living with integrity, and what's clear is that if we follow God and live out our faith with integrity, his blessings will be upon us in some way. Proverbs 10, 9, whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his ways crooked will be found out. Proverbs eleven three: the integrity of the upright guides them, but the crookedness of the treacherous destroys them. Proverbs 20, verse 7, the righteous who walk in integrity, blessed are their children after them. Psalms 41, by this I know that you delight in me. My enemies will not shout in triumph over me, but you have upheld me because of my integrity and set me in your presence forever. And Psalm 7, 8, the Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is within me. There's a story that appeared in... Um, USA Today a number of years ago, um, talking about Titanic, the ship that was labeled the unsinkable ship. And after the ship sank in 1912, the most widely held theory was that it hit an iceberg 
and it opened a huge gash in the side of the ship, which caused it to sink. But when divers got down to examine the wreckage, they found that the damage was surprisingly small, that it wasn't a big gash in the side of the hole that sunk it, but it was six relatively narrow slits across that sunk it. It wasn't one big hole. It was multiple little holes that sunk it. And they added this to the end of the story, that small damage, invisible to most, can sink not only a great ship, but a great reputation. And the thing about Daniel is he didn't just keep the, the the, the the major things under control in his life, but he looked at the smaller things as well. He was undivided in his loyalties, and no one else was able to live like he did around him because no one else had the relationship to God that he did. And a true life of integrity can be found nowhere else. It is empowered by the Spirit of God within us. My challenge to us today is simply to ask, am I a person of integrity? And if you find something out of sync with God in your life, may we give it to him and be undivided in our commitments to him. The questions we need to ask are, do we keep our word? Do we do what's right when we could get away with it? Do we do what's right despite circumstances and despite the costs? And do you truly believe that there is blessing in living out a life of integrity in your faith? And so to the fathers here today, this is the type of person that your spouse and your children need you to be. What our children need is men in their life, fathers in their life, who show them the way who live out their faith authentically and show what it means to to, to live with integrity. And if you live like this, it will not only affect your life, but it will impact the people around you, especially your children. We need men who lead their families with integrity and authentic faith. Amen. And in a society that is trying to erode the definition of what it means to be a man and what it means to be a father, May we instead follow Daniel's example and stand firm in truth and live in such a way where people know what we stand for and what we believe in. If we were put on trial for corruption, how would we come out? One day we will stand before Jesus and you know what? We can't hide anything from him. (laughs) Even if we get away with it in this life, we won't get away with it with him. And my true hope is that, you know, one day my children can look back and say, he showed me the way. He showed me the way. May that be true of all of us this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this example that Daniel gives us in in integrity. And Lord, I just want to pray for all of us here today, but especially the, the men and the fathers here today, Father, I ask that you would empower each one. God, point out the things in each of our lives that maybe is not in sync with you entirely and help us to be undivided in our loyalty to you above all. And may our faith be passed on to those around us, especially those who call us dad. And so, Father, I pray that as we go today, empower all of us to live out our faith in our communities, in our workplaces, or wherever else we find ourselves this week. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, to the fathers today, um, on your way out, there will be a couple of girls who are handing out some uh, treats. Uh, You'll have your choice of a Snickers ice cream bar or a Fat Boy ice cream sandwich. And... um, Maybe you let your wife choose which one. (laughs) You are dismissed.